With us right now is Jenna Dodson. She is the uh, staff scientist at the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. She joins us via telephone. Good morning, Jenna. Thanks so much for being with us today. Good morning, all. Thanks for having me. Have you seen Dark Waters, Jenna? I have seen Dark Waters, yes, and it is terrifying. <laughs> it is, absolutely, because it's true. And that's, yes. that's it's, it's not some slasher movie, uh, you know, like a Friday the 13th. This is true stuff, and it's, it's uh, abhorrent in terms of uh, how this has been allowed to happen uh, to so many people. Jenna, uh, you are doing a screening here, No Defense, uh, today, and in this uh, community, it says the parallels in the story of the Michigan town to Martinsburg uh, are there. Uh, where can we see No Defense to get a screening of this? Yeah, so West Virginia Rivers is going to be hosting a free showing of No Defense tonight at 7 p.m. at the Bird Center for Congressional History and Education um, on the campus of Shepherd University. And uh, the, tell me about the, the, the screening of this here, No Defense. Is it a documentary, a, a movie of sorts, a, the, the length of it, all that good stuff? Yeah, it's a documentary, um, and like you said, it tells the story of a small town in Michigan, um, Oscoda, Michigan, that was near an Air Force base, particularly the, the Wordsmith Air Force Base, where PFAS contaminated the local drinking water supply. And so the movie is, well, to be precise, the movie is 71 minutes long, um, and then there's going to be about a 45-minute period after for audience discussion. And like you said, Stephen Skinner is going to be there and give about a five-minute intro um, going over kind of what actions are being taken legally, uh, locally. So that's the format for tonight. And then the event will wrap up around 9 p.m. Can you give us a synopsis of the story of No Defense? Um, you know, I actually haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tonight is going to be my first time seeing it, so okay, I, cool. I cannot give you a synopsis. <laughs> Tell us about PFAS chemicals and how widespread this problem is in the drinking water. Is, is it in most public drinking water supplies by this point? Um, well, that's what we're, we're trying to find out, and I can only speak for what we found out so far in West Virginia, but a little bit of background about PFAS chemicals. So PFAS is actually an acronym. It stands for per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So they're a very large group of man-made chemicals that have been used in products and manufacturing since the 1950s. Um, and there was a study that was released last year that found that PFAS were detected in the raw water of 130 public water systems around West Virginia at levels that were higher than the EPA's um, recently released health advisory. So at least in West Virginia, um, PFAS are found in the source water or the raw water of just under half of our public drinking water systems. So definitely a notable concerning problem in our state. What is the EPA, this is John Gilstrap, what is the EPA accepted level and what were the detected levels? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So the EPA from last, from their recently released health advisories, they released four health advisories. And so they were for PFOA, and that um, health advisory was 0 0.004 parts per trillion. Uh, also, there was a health advisory for PFOS, which was 0 0.02 parts per trillion. Uh, another one for PFBS, which was 2,000 parts per trillion. And then Gen X chemicals, and that was 10 parts per trillion. And just to give a little context, because I don't think people um, hear parts per trillion very much, um, one part per trillion is equivalent to a single drop of water in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So we're talking about very small um, amounts of these chemicals. And so the uh, 130 that, that were higher than the health advisories were higher than those PFOA and PFOS levels. Okay. It, it I used to be in this line of business, the hazmat business and, and such. I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. So 0 0.004 parts per trillion is four mm -hmm. one thousandths of one part per billion, which is one ten millionth of one percent. So right. we can de cool. how do we detect at these levels? We're looking at atomic levels. Right. So that's an, another excellent question. So that was kind of a, a controversy when the EPA released these health advisories because they are currently below detection limits. However, the research and the funding um, for this research is evolving very rapidly. Um, and so detection limits and levels are just getting 
better and better by the day, and we're kind of waiting on edge right now for EPA to release a drinking water standard. So that's a, it's called an MCL, a maximum containment level, which would be an enforceable um, regulation level for PFOA and PFOS, those two ones that I just mentioned. Um, and so they're going to be releasing that a draft level within the next month is what they say. Have there have there been any studies to let us know what how, what level of these chemicals could be dangerous to human beings? Yeah, yeah. So those are the studies that um, the interim health advisories were based upon. Most of the research that's been done has been done on PFOA and PFOS, and so those studies do show that those are toxic chemicals at very, very small concentrations. Um, and they are even more studies continuing for all the other PFAS um, to try to build up more, more research and more literature to better understand the health effects for the other PFAS as well. If, if we stay in the parts per trillion as the enforceable level, that makes it more toxic than VX, which is a nerve agent that, is, you know, that was weaponized and is no longer legal. This, this just seems difficult to comprehend at this point. What are, the, what are the enforceable limits at this point? Well, there are no enforceable limits at this point, um, at least on a federal level. Some states have taken action, and they've created kind of their statewide um, maximum contaminant levels. Uh, West Virginia hasn't done anything like that, but other states have done things like that. Um, and I would say that the MCL, something that you know EPA takes into consideration, are the costs and the technological limitations when they're when they're creating these drinking water standards. So they are going to take that into consideration when they release that um, that standard. Is there currently a mechanism to take these things out of the water? Is there a filtering process that can be done at the local level through the, the filtration of our water? Yeah, definitely. So um, granular activated carbon and reverse osmosis are the two um, widely used filtration technologies. And those can be used on a like at a water treatment plant level and also um, at an in-home level as well. So there are, there are technologies out there, but then kind of the, the next question is those PFAS still need to be destroyed and the destruction technologies are still um, evolving to the scale where we need them to be to be able to destroy the PFAS. Out of the 130, are the city of Martinsburg or Berkeley County or Jefferson County or any of those in, the, in that dangerous range? Um, the city of Martinsburg and Berkeley County, so because they had kind of a, a PFAS contamination event related to the Shepherd Field Air National Guard Base and the use of um, firefighting foam on that air base, they've had a treatment system installed. I believe that was installed in, in 2017. However, there are about 30 other utilities in the eastern panhandle um, that did have detectable or, or excuse me um, levels of PFAS that were higher than the health advisories detected in their raw water. Has any corrective action been taken in those situations? Yeah that's a great question. So right now we are um, there's a bill in the legislature called the PFAS Protection Act um, and so we that is a, a really important bill that's going to um, basically have have the EP, the Department of Environmental Protection, start to take action. So what that bill would do would require um, DEP to develop action plans with those utilities to help identify the sources of PFAS that are contributing to the detections in their raw water. And it would also help um, require industry to monitor and report PFAS discharges when they're discharging them into our surface water. Um, and it would also establish statewide limits on PFAS discharges once EPA issues um, those criteria. So EPA is going to be issuing some surface water criteria for, um, for PFAS in the next couple, probably the next couple of years. It's a long process. Um, but that piece of legislation is kind of the first um, action that we would be taking on a statewide level. Um, and so that bill um, had meant it's a bipartisan bill that's been co-sponsored by many of the legislators uh, that represent um, folks in the Eastern Panhandle and actually is going to be on the House floor for a vote tomorrow. It's House Bill 3189. So that's really reassuring to see. And I think that that communities and um, members of the public and legislators are really seeing the, the issue and um, 
kind of rallying to take action to try to start solving the problem. Is it a very expensive process for a water system to get this stuff out of there before it gets to the people? Yeah, yeah. Um, it can be an expensive process, and that's another consideration. Um, and at West Virginia Rivers, we really want to make sure that it's not the utilities and the ratepayers that are bearing the cost of addressing this contamination, um, but also the um, the polluters who have been putting PFAS into the waterways also need to be helping, and we need to reduce PFAS at the source as well. So there's a lot of federal funding, actually, that's been coming in over this past year and will be continuing um, to be provided for the next 15 years um, in the bipartisan infrastructure law to address PFAS contamination and to help utilities and states have the funding they need to be able to install the treatment systems to remove these chemicals. How does PFAS toxicity manifest itself in the body? Yeah, like what are the health effects? Is that kind of what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, there are a wide range of health effects. Um, some of them include various cancers, so kidney cancer and testicular cancer, breast cancer, all of those cancers have been um, have been related to PFAS exposure, and you could also have liver damage, there's thyroid disease, um, a weakened immune system is another one, and PFAS can actually get into, um, like, babies before they're born, um, so it can be transferred um, from the mother to the, the fetus before, before it's even born into the world. So there are many wide-ranging health effects, and I would say also children are a lot more susceptible because they're still developing than adults, and it is concerning that many elementary schools in the Eastern Panhandle had um, PFAS that were detected at levels above those health advisories. So the health effects are widespread and definitely concerning. Um, and another reason why we want to address this problem as soon as possible. But, uh, let me ask a bottom line question. You are a scientist. This is what you do. Um, would you let your children drink uh, local public uh, water as their, their source of drinking water? Or would you do spring water? Or do you filter at home? How do you handle it? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, well, I think it depends. It depends on which utility that I had. So, I mean... As a scientist, I would want to look at the study and see, was it my utility that was one of those 130? Was it um, was my utility one of the ones that had PFAS uh, detected in their raw water? And if it was, then I would consider perhaps purchasing um, a point-of-use filter or an in-home filter until the data come out um, that are going to show the levels of PFAS or lack of PFAS in the finished water. So as a follow-up um, to the study that was released last year, DEP is partnering with USGS to, to sample the levels of PFAS in the finished water, right, so after it's been through the water treatment process. Um, but I think in the meantime, it's better to err on the side of caution. Um, but then again, I think that, you know, being able to, to buy a filter, that's not something that's equally available to everyone. So we do need to have both a you know like a bottom up and a top down approach to be able to to solve the problem in the long term. Jenna Dodson is our guest, staff scientist at West Virginia Rivers, and uh, this evening they'll be screening no defense, seventy one minutes in length at the uh, Bird Center on the campus of Shepherd University, and discussing PFAS uh, chemicals here, chemicals on the program here. Uh, Jenna, is the danger in ingesting this water, or is there an equal amount of danger in bathing in it, for instance? That's a great question. Um, the primary route of exposure is through drinking. If you're bathing or showering, um, you should be A-OK. -okay. And then next, I have a comment from Eric O'Rourke on our uh, Facebook comment section that states the toxicity of the chemicals is much less nowadays compared to what was years ago. Uh, true statement, scientist Jenna Dodson? Um, well, I'm not sure what he means by toxicity, if he means like the health effects from exposure or if he means toxicity as in the levels, like the concentrations, if mm -hmm. they've been diluted as opposed to many years ago. So, for example, in, um, in Parkersburg in the, the 90s and the 2000s, that was where there was a, a pretty serious contamination event. The city of Vienna and Parkersburg, their drinking water supply was contaminated with PFOA, and so... During those decades, the concentrations and the toxicity of, of, drink, of consuming that water was very high because the concentrations were so high. But I think if he's talking about, like, the concentrations 
in the water are a little bit lower because it's been diluted and it's not being discharged at such high quantities anymore. Maybe that's what he's talking about. In regards to products, I know in the movie Dark Waters, and it covered some of that Parkersburg situation you were just addressing there, I talked about nonstick cookware that was out at that time as being a source of some of the contaminants. Is that still an issue that we need to worry about what's in our kitchen that way? Yeah, definitely. So so drinking water is one pathway of exposure, and another pathway of exposure is PFAS. Um, in food, and the, the two kind of primary ways that PFAS can get into food is using that nonstick cookware, um, and also PFAS is in food packaging. So there's recommendations if you're trying to reduce your individual exposure to um, ultimately not use to-go food packaging um, and, like, remove the food from the food packaging as soon as possible. And, I mean, PFAS is also in, in microwave popcorn bags. So if you're popping popcorn, maybe use the kernels um, moving forward. And so there definitely is um, PFAS that are, are getting, are, that we are exposed to through, through food and food products as well. If we've known these things for, as you said, that case in Parkersburg was in the 90s, if 30 years of evidence of this, why are these chemicals still being used in places where we can ingest them through things that are so easily correctable as microwave popcorn? Yeah, that is a really great question that I do not know the answer to. <laughs> I think that would be a question for the more powers that be. Um, the microwave I, popcorn lobby yeah. is pretty strong. <laughs> Packaging lobby. Yeah. Um, but I would say that it's reassuring to see that um, companies and manufacturing are starting to implement some of those PFAS bans, um, and they have deadlines as soon as 2025 to remove PFAS from their products. So that is something that's starting. It's unfortunate that it's taken this long, but we are moving in that direction. So if you're elected PFAS czar, you can you can wave a magic wand and have have the result be perfect. What would you propose that we do? Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I don't mean to be a loaded question, but what's, what's the end game? In a perfect world, what's the end game? Well, I think in a perfect world, the end game is to stop using PFAS. Um, and also, we need to make sure that it's not being induced anymore. And so that kind of goes along with stop using it. So we have tons of PFAS out there in the environment. So we need to kind of scale up these destruction technologies so we can remove it from the environment and we can destroy it. And then we can make sure that we're not introducing any more PFAS into, um, into the environment and then, you know, potentially into our human bodies through exposure. How is it destroyed? Um, so it can be incinerated, though that is something that hasn't really um, gone to the scale that we need it to right now um, and there's lots of other destruction technologies that they're they're looking into right now such as supercritical water oxidation and also plasma reactors um, so that's one of the technologies that's um, developing very rapidly does incineration put it into the air does that do anything to the ozone or anything like that if we destroy or just in general of the air that we breathe yeah yeah it, it does yes Yes, PFAS can and has been found um, in the air, and so that is another reason why it maybe isn't the best destruction technology because then you would need some way to kind of trap um, the smoke that you would be be letting off, and then ultimately like destroy it. We could we could st more. we could trap the smoke in water, and that would sort of bring the whole cycle around. Send it to Putin's yeah, house. Yeah, yeah send it. It just so, it just sounds like no matter what we do. Um, these things that we have created are here to stay, and, you know, we need to try yeah. to... Well, if we trap it in activated charcoal, can't we just bury the activated charcoal in a hazardous waste landfill and be done with it? I mean, you could, yeah. And so, but then I think, like, one of the um, sources of PFAS is leachate from landfills, so you would just need to make sure that there's no way that, that it can get out. But we're already seeing that you know, it's already leaking. So if it's um, a leaking hazardous I mean, waste landfill, it's really not a very good hazardous waste landfill to begin with. So I prefer the non-porous <laughs> hazardous waste <laughs> landfills myself if I'm voting. Uh, yeah. Jenna, yeah. Uh, Jenna um, and I guess these are called forever chemicals for a reason. And it seems mm -hmm. like as you're describing ways to get rid of them, there seems to be no real way to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Well, they, I think that, the, that, like I said, the technologies are rapidly developing and the supercritical water oxidation and plasma reactors are, are scaling up. 
slowly but surely. I mean, really what you're trying to break is that carbon to fluorine bond, um, which is one of the strongest bonds, and, and that's why it's so difficult to break. It doesn't break down in natural processes, and so they're really trying to figure out the easiest way to break that bond and then scale that that technology up to the scale that we need it to, um, to be at to be able to destroy the chemicals. Jenna, to wrap it up, and first and foremost, uh, great job today because we fired questions at you rapid fire without even telling you in advance what the questions would be, and you handled mm-hmm. all of them flawlessly, so great job. Uh, and then mm-hmm. uh, next, if you could, once again, uh, more detail about the screening tonight, how people can get to see it. Yeah, sure. Well, I would just say thank you again for having me on. I really appreciated this conversation. Um, and yeah, the screening tonight, so it's of the documentary No Defense, and it's going to start at 7 p.m. at the Bird Center for Congressional History and Education at Shepherd University. After the, the film, there's going to be an audience discussion, um, and like you said, Stephen Skinner, a local attorney, is going to be there, and we'll have about 45 minutes of audience discussion, and then it'll wrap up around 9, and I hope as many folks can make it as possible. Are you guys going to be coming in? I will not be coming in this evening. I'm the morning guy here, so that gets into the later hours of the day for me. <laughs> uh, but I do have a question for you in regards to the 71-minute documentary. Uh, who would I talk to about uh, being able to air that on our TV station here? Mm, they have a website. If you were to Google No Defense, um, they have like a film website where you can request screenings. So I would suggest that route. I will do that. Jenna, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thanks, day. Thanks, Jenna.